Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ridgeline Minerals Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. Today, I'm joined by Chad Peters, Ridgeline's President, CEO, and Director, and Mike Hart, the company's Vice President of Exploration. Chad and Mike are going to walk us through their presentation, and after which, we'll move to the live Q&A session, where we'll be accepting and answering some questions. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen. And as always, the summit is being recorded, and it'll be available to watch afterwards on SIX.com. So without further ado, Chad, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thanks, Cam. Um, so thanks, everyone, for taking the time to attend today. Um, we just announced our uh, last results from our phase four drill program at Selena. And Mike and I thought with all of the changes that have been going on, we're hitting this, you know, some pretty exciting high grade polymetallic, you know, silver, lead and zinc mineralization in the first phase of our program. We really wanted to get into the kind of weeds with you guys, walk through the model, talk about what gets us excited about the project and what our plans are uh, moving forward into uh, the fall and then into you know, more drilling in 2022. So we'll just get right into it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Selena, it's a 39 square kilometer land package. Um, it used to be an oxide silver gold play. Now we see an oxide silver gold plus or minus lead and zinc, depending on where we're drilling on the project. So lots of discovery potential, multiple deposit types, and the system just keeps on growing. So. Um, We'll look at a bird's eye view here. And here you can see, you know, we're right on the South Carlin trend. We're right near the Golden Butte mine, which is owned by Nev Gold Corp and the Butte Valley Porphyry, which is owned by Katera. That's a copper gold porphyry on the edge of the project. You look over to the Northwest, we're right on trend to the Bald Mountain and the Alligator Ridge mines. These are about 10, 12 kilometers away and uh, hosted in the same host rocks that we see at Salina. So a lot of similarities, both of them big open pit um, gold plus or minus silver mines. And uh, we'll get into the details on Selena here. So here's just a quick property view. As you can see, uh, we added additional claims. Actually, just last week we announced we added about all of these claims here. So an additional, I think, what, 42 claims, Mike? That would be correct. Yeah, 42 claims off to the west side. Um, and it abuts directly up against the Butte Valley Porphyry um, as it sits in a mag response that we have for the area. Yeah, so we didn't have time to what we're, we're going to be building the Butte Valley Porphyry into our model here as we go. What I want to highlight, here's where the edge of that porphyry, whoops, here's where the edge of that porphyry sits. So it's sitting right off the edge of the project. And our goal with staking this ground was to just be able to soak up as much ground as we could between our known discovery, which sits in this area, and the more than three kilometers of strike between the porphyry and our known hits that um, really has us excited for next year's program. So we'll get walking into... Here's just kind of a, a breakdown of some of the methods that we use on the project to try to track mineralization undercover. So this right here is our geology map. Over top of that, you can see we actually have arsenic um, soils contour. So that's Mike's handiwork there, a bit of an artist. And one thing that we've uh, been able to show is that anytime you get nice plumes of arsenic, anemone, lead and zinc, we also end up when we drill beneath those plumes, we typically hit mineralization. So it's been a very effective tool for us. We have some pretty nice high grade rock chips in the Juniper target. Here's a nice high grade rock chip right here, which is right near our hole 27, which we're gonna get into here shortly. Give you a little more context. And what we did last year is we actually came in and we trenched across um, one of these fault zones and hits pretty significant mineralization. So 38 meters of 51 grams silver, 0.7 grams gold, sitting right on the hillside. That got me pretty excited because I wasn't terribly pumped about the project back in early 2020, although Mike told me it uh, it had a lot of potential. So I came around and what we did is we came in and we, we drilled all the holes in yellow are the 36 holes that we've drilled um, in 2020 and 2021. Here's Mike's great little uh, silver equivalent grade thickness map, as you can see. And um, what we're really starting to define with this most recent program is some really strong high grade centers that are focused along Northwest fault zones. So what I want to show you here is these, everything outlined in red here is Jasper outcrops. And Mike, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. So um, what those Jasper outcrops are following is actually the thrust sheets, the edge of thrust sheets, um, where you have repeated sections on top of each other. Um, and so what we're seeing here is the expression of the system along these thrust sheets, but not necessarily where the highest grades are sitting. So you can see that those, those outcrops of Jasperoid follow that north-south thrust fabric, but it's not until you get the intersection with the west-northwest and the northeast faults that you're starting to see those high-grade zones really start to blow out. Um, most of our drilling in our first, second, and third phases were focused on our 
north south where they intersected the west northwest but we really weren't drilling the west northwest fabric at that time what we found here in our phase four drilling that if we isolate those those intersections and drill against or perpendicular to those west northwest faults we start to see those high grade zones really start to blossom and we start to see them drag out along that west northwest corridor we have many of these as you can see from this map that we can isolate and start to really work on um, where they intersect those north uh, northeast faults and the um, the thrust fabric itself, which is what those jasporoid outcrops are following. So the jasporoid outcrops at surface really are um, an indicator of system below, but not necessarily where the system is propagating or showing its highest grades. And I think that's a you know a good point to point out for us is um, you know I'm going to highlight in yellow here. Here's these thrust faults that are lined out in black, right? That's where those jasperoid outcrops are tracking along. We originally thought those were actual just normal faults. We thought those were the feeder faults, right? You can see that you got these parallel thrust sheets that are going all the way along. So uh, most of our drilling, as you can see, it mostly tracked in a north-south orientation following along the jasperoids. And that's what Mike was getting to when he says, well, you know, just following the jasperoids isn't good enough because you actually want to be where that thrust sheet is intersecting a northwester and the northeaster, like Mike said, that's where we're getting high grade blowout zones. And so if you take these off just because that's a little busy, you know, here's for example, whoops, to get into the high grades Mike's talking about. I mean, you get in on one of these northwesters, we hit our best intercept yet in hole 25, for example, right? That was 44 meters of 0.07 gold, 123 grams silver, percent and a half lead, and half a percent of zinc. 100 meters south of that, we hit um, three meter or Oh, sorry, that's a little wrong. 4.6 meters of um, really high grade stuff. I think we hit what 421 grams silver, um, multi percent lead and zinc. I think we were 4% lead, 3.5% zinc, and 0.6 grams per ton gold. So, what we're starting to see in these high grade cores, I'm going to zoom out a bit here for you because I've zoomed in too much. What we're really starting to see is as we head to the west, we're really getting into more of that, that silver, lead, zinc component of what we think is a CRD, a zone CRD system. So if our, just to put it in perspective, here's the edge of this porphyry sitting on the edge of the project. And the way that system is going to expand out essentially is it's going to start as, as a copper gold porphyry right on the porphyry itself. Then it's going to move into a copper gold scarn. Then it's going to transition into CRDs, which carbonate replacement deposit. It's going to be polymetallic, you know, silver, gold, lead, and zinc. And as it moves farther and farther away from the porphyry, you're going to see that system change from the CRD, and then it's going to go to silver and gold, which is what we hit right here originally. Our original discovery is a pure silver gold um, play. And as we head up to Sonic now, what we're seeing is that's turning into more of a gold, gold rich, uh, silver poor part of the system when you say Mike, and it's just showing that transition. Exactly, and it's the most distal portion of our property to the, the plumbing that actually taps into what would be that, that porphyry system off to the west. And so, yeah, as we move north into, Chind or into the Sonic area, we do still see those gold grades and silver grades hold, but you're looking at a 10 to one silver, ratio, silver to gold ratio as where you move into the Chinchilla area or the main portion of our drilling, we're seeing anywhere from 25 to one, 50 to one, up to 100 to one as we move out west towards that porphyry. So we're really starting to see that zonation pattern really start to take hold. Um, and now that we're aware of that, that's really gonna change how our next phase of drilling goes, especially out in that chainman where we got our new intercept um, in the press release we put out today. So we're starting to see all the, the favorable contacts start to produce this system. And as we move out west, we're starting to see that system zone into the CRD. And then hopefully as we continue out westward, we'll see that copper scarn portion of the system as well. So there's a lot of open area westward from the GT shape that we've defined at this point. And our drilling that we did in our phase four out on these wide step outs to the west um, our first dips uh, into the water. So we haven't even really played out there as much as we'd like to yet. So excited to get out there and kind of start working on the new portions of the deposit while continuing to find these high grade corners um, in the GT shape that we've already defined um, yeah. with our first phase, four, uh, four phases of drilling. No, that's a great point. And, and you know, like what you, this is kind of a good example, I guess you could say of what we believe is happening with the zonation, which I was kind of drawing and Mike was speaking to. Um, and just something that's worth pointing out you know, over at the broken egg target, which is more than five kilometers away from this porphyry sitting right here. 
I mean, we're talking about a less than one to one silver to gold. So we have rock chips in the broken egg target area that are just pure gold, gram and a half gold in the pilot shale at surface with no silver component whatsoever. So we really do feel that it, what we're seeing at, at Selena is we have the fully preserved metal zonation pattern of a large porphyry system. And what we were initially looking at, um, you know, we thought we just had a silver, silver and gold open open pit uh, deposit. But what's what's really getting us, uh, I think, excited about next year is the potential to, to discover. You know, we've already hit sediment hosted silver and gold. We know where the sediment hosted gold kind of classic Carlin type potential is on the far side of the property of Broken Egg, but we have not even barely tapped into the silver lead zinc CRD potential, and we think we just tagged into it on the edge of the project here. And that's where we're starting to get some of those grades I was talking about, you know, 10 meters of 194 gram silver, multi percent lead and zinc. And, um, you know, and another thing to point out too, um, going back to these other slides, is that, uh, you know, the initial focus for us was not, you know, we didn't expect to hit a polymetallic, uh, a polymetallic system at surface, right? I mean, we were looking, we thought it was just silver gold. So we kind of have had to adjust on the fly. Our model is quickly evolving. And, and I think it's really important to point out that this is still extremely early days for the project. I mean, we're not in the resource delineation phase. We're still trying to understand how big this thing could be. Um, you know, we know we have system up at Selena or Sonic, sorry, but we believe, from what we can tell from our drilling, I think our best intercept was 15 meters of 35 gram silver equivalent, right? That's, that's, right. Not, that's not far off of our first four holes at the Chinchilla Discovery, which was, I think our best hit was 24 meters of about 37 gram silver equivalent. So pretty similar grades, but we do see the silver dropping off and the gold starting to pick up at Sonic. So we need to better understand the zonation of that system before we start putting more holes into it. So what gets us? Well, go and ahead. That was part of the strategy of staking the ground out to the west. That leaves a lot of open ground uh, westward from Sonic, um, in order to start um, working on that that target itself and see if there's more legs to it out out further west, where we know we have some intrusive material um, uh, injecting into the system. So that's that's what I see for Sonic is it's very shallow. It's at surface. Um, partial part of it is just eroded. Um, because it's the highest portion of our property and the least amount of stratigraphy, stratigraphy we have preserved. So there is stratigraphy preserved um, out to the west, and that's where Sonic would likely go, the same direction that the chinchilla or main portion of our of our drilling um, is focused. That all, again, and then that also comes off of our juniper target, which is relatively the most untested zone um, out of all of it. So we have a lot of open ground here. And what I did like about the chin or the sonic drilling is um, hole 35, if you'll circle that one, the one that pulled the RGT shape up to the north. Um, up oh, there right. and hole 36 that right. came after that, yeah. yeah. So those holes right there really show that there's some thick zones in which we can start to drill out there. But what it's really showing is the system is expanding out to the west and we may not have hit the best zones yet because we weren't focused in 100% on those west northwest faults when we started this program. And like Chad said, we adjusted on the fly and we started turning the rigs to hit those more squarely. Um, but there's still a lot more opportunity out there. So if we're in phase four of the whole entire project, Sonic only saw its first phase of drilling and our drilling out to the west, which is getting into that CRD portion, would be considered a phase one. And if you look at the center of our GT shape, that's three phases of drilling honing in on those on those really high grade corners. We have those opportunities and they still exist as we move out and hit these same intersections at different lithological horizons. And that's why the chainman is so important as a hit, as, as having a, a, a good solid number coming off of that contact with the Joanna. That shows us that that contact is alive. We can bring our mineralization shallower. And as we move west, we have stacked horizons that we really have to start honing in on, especially at these structural intersections, because they're important, as you can see here at Selena. You bet. And what I'm going to do here is just to give you guys some context, Mike, I'm going to start walking through DD prime. We'll look yeah. at hole 27. Hole 27 is right here, folks. And it drilled this direction. We're going to go DD prime. And then we're just going to walk through each high grade center all the way to the north. These are about 200 meters apart, maybe even a little bit more, close to 300 meters apart. So we're talking at just, uh, just just around a kilometer of strike in the north-south, already defined of high-grade centers. And there's some pretty impressive continuity across them. So we'll go to DD Prime first. There we go. All right, so Mike, do you wanna show them why we're excited about this? 
So um, our first couple of holes we put into that area was much like what we did uh, on our original trenches. We drilled where we saw the superficial expressions and really tried to hit it at depth and offset it as we moved westward. Uh, what we realized is that the tyrant fault or the middle fault uh, on this picture um, is one of those stronger, more powerful faults along with the Maximus out to the west. So the interesting thing that I have here is we have a wide open tyrant fault, which at the moment hosts most of the highest grades we're seeing on the property. Two, we have bookended hits between SE 2136 um, and then SE 10 that we drilled uh, last year, all, all the way out uh, to our new hole 27 uh, to the west. And we're still seeing those high grades and we're still seeing the same zonation pattern as we moved westward. So we have a big wide open zone right there and a geochemical anomaly in soils and in rock chips that says that there should be something also in this area as well. Um, we also see one of our larger uh, uh, silver hits in soils for this area as well. Uh, yeah, there you go. Just so yeah, really there's strong uh, signature. Um, and so that's what we're excited about. I mean, the, the pilot shale, which is the main unit that's in the middle of that cross section, that light blue to dark blue, the Joanna to the dark blue is the, is the pilot. That is a very constrictive um, unit. And so that doesn't let many mineralizing fluids up, but it does come up where the, the big faults, the cracks are. And so that's where you're seeing those, those higher grade soils um, and rock chips are right on that fault. So there's a hidden, <laughs> kind of like a hidden, uh, chance right there between the two and we we see the systems alive and so that'll be one of those areas we really focus in on and we already have permitted pads and roads for this area um, and one of those areas I'd like to get in next year to show that that tyrant fault is still alive um, as we move south towards uh, south and west towards uh, the Butte Valley Porphyry. Whoops. Yeah and, and you know like one of the another thing to point out this is the first time right here that I'm circling first time we've ever hit a mineralized intercept in the chainman and it's pretty high grade stuff. I mean, that's as good a silver as we hit in our original discovery. It's showing pops of lead, pop, pops, uh, little pops of lead, little pops of gold. We don't think we're fully on to the main part of, of the system yet. And it's really encouraging to see something out in the middle of essentially a 500 meter step out from the closest hole in being hole 21. And then on top of that, we hit these intercepts here. I mean, this is 1.2 kilometers. You can fit the width of the entire defined zone between up to the north in that 1.2 kilometer section. So there's tons of potential to expand the system out here. Um, we're going to start stepping to the north and you can really see what I want you to notice is most of the grade is focused on this fault, just like Mike was saying. So, you know, we've kind of, like you said, we've bookended the system out here with this section DD prime, lots of potential for infill as we step, you know, 200 meters here to the north you can really see how this starts to to take off, right? You got 44 meters right there in hole 21, 44 meters of 75 gram silver, 0.2 gold, 1% lead, 0.3% zinc. That's certainly not the high grade lead zinc we've seen farther to the north, but it's starting to get into that. We also hit in hole 28, which was announced today, 108 meters of 13 and a half gram silver equivalent. Now that is certainly not a screaming hot grade. Well, Mike and I would be the first person to admit that we would have loved to have seen that been 100 meters of 80 or 90 or 100 grams. But to put in perspective, the Rochester mine um, out here in Nevada is the only silver mine um, in operation, open pit silver mine. Their average grades are in the range of 21 grams per ton silver equivalent for their average head grade. Their lower cutoff, I believe, is, is even lower than that. It will be lower than that. So. It shows scale, you know, it shows that we can mineralize large widths of rock, you know, 108 meters, that's that's a significant intercept. And then alongside that, we have some high grade pops, 71 meters of 21 grams, higher grade, not super high grade, 44 meters of 75. So there's that potential to continue growing this thing. We haven't tested any holes out this direction. And, um, you know, so it really blows out here. Then we step another 200 meters to the north again, and this is probably our best section we've drilled at least from a um, high grade perspective, wouldn't you say, yeah. Mike? Yeah, as a high grade perspective. And then to, as a comment on the previous section you were just on, that is what I like about Selena is not only do we know we can hit high grade centers, but we do have the opportunity for the larger zones. 108 meters is pretty significant. If we can get 108 meters with those higher grades that we see out of say hole 21 or 25, um, we're really in the ballpark for a, a big system here. And that's what this thing looks like it's starting to produce. And so that's why I was excited. Although a low grade intercept, 108 meters is nothing to shake a stick at. Not to mention the fact that you have right behind it in the in a similar position, 44.2 meters 
of 75.6 grams, you know, and then you're starting to see that polymetallic system start to propagate from there. Yeah. And so that's what I really like about this section. But then as we move north to that, really the high grade section where we, uh, in the last press release, we released uh, holes 24 and 25. Um, that's just, what the system really has going for it. Um, it yeah. can really do that. And um, moving out westward and testing that Tyrant fault um, in different locations, I think we can still continue. Uh, we'll continue to see these these high grade zones and hopefully thicker high grade zones than we've seen um, in our drilling at this point. But we're really starting to get a handle on what's controlling our system, how thick it can be, and we've also started to apply an XRF unit out in the field to better gear our drilling to make sure we're not TDing early um, or TDing at the appropriate time, knowing that we're out of system. Yeah, so we're really had trying to to understand the metrics of our system, apply that, and vector in the best directions possible. Yeah, you know, like these three holes were all drilled in 2020. Now we have an XRF. We knew we were still in system. We took this thing all the way down here and we hit a much wider intercept. So certainly there's potential to go back, drill wider intercepts. Um, and it's worth mentioning too, that hole 28 right here is hundred about 100 meters or 80 meters to the north of this high grade intercept here. So these holes aren't actually stacked right on top of each other. It's just a nice wide section to show the system. And then as we step to the north, like Mike was saying, we really start getting into you know, this is kind of our, the best hole we've certainly ever drilled on the project was hole 25 right there. I mean, 44 meters of 123 grams per ton silver, 0.1 gold, 2% lead, 0.6% zinc. Um, we had a, a 13 meters of an including that was over a percent lead zinc and almost 200 grams per ton silver. So um, there is both a open pit potential to this system. You know, we have outcropping silver gold mineralization at surface, and we're starting to see grades that are actually within the realm of underground mineable grades. Um, you know, when you look at like hole 29, this hole, we ran out of drill rods, right? Like yep. Mike, you, know, you were out at the drill rig and you're like, man, we're right heading into the system. The XRF started popping right here. We hit 56 meters of two grams per ton silver equivalent. And we just, you know, we were six hours out um, away from the, the driller's main uh, site. They can only fit 1,600 feet of uh, core, or I guess it'd be what, uh, I don't know, meters, 1,600 feet of core of core yeah. or of RC rods onto the truck. So we ran out of rods. Uh, you know, ideally, we would have liked to have taken this hole right to about there, give or take, to make sure we fully tested this system on the other side of the fault zone. So, you know, agreed. And we, in, in, on this section, you can see we haven't even tested the Juniper fault or the Tyrant fault proper. Um, these were our first tests out into these zones just to see what was going to happen. 25 being uh, specifically zoned in on the intersection, um, applying what we had learned over the, the previous three phases. And that was the result. And it was a good one. And I like that those, the main fault zones themselves remain untested and we we're going to come back and, and work on those as well. And yeah, running out of drill rods is never something somebody wants to do, but you know, when you're going after shallow oxide, you don't plan on going further than 1600 feet. And we didn't understand the throw on the, on the tyrant fault when we were drilling it, uh, or I'm sorry, on the juniper fault when we were drilling it. So that was another thing. So next time we'll come a little bit more prepared in a rig that has a deeper capacity now that we know we're going after both the CRD component and eventually, um, hopefully, the copper portion of the copper scarn portion of, of the zonation pattern. Yeah, because as we, you know, here's where we are sitting just to give some perspective here. You know, we got the silver equivalent. Here's the porphyry again, just to orient yourself right about here is the, the edge of the porphyry. We're getting our high grade center right here. Hole 29 hit hundreds of feet of alteration, low grades, um, silver, gold. And, um, you know, we think as we continue to step out this direction, which if you look to the section is out into the chainman, you know, even out here, almost a kilometer away, you have a, a historic drill hole that tapped into 32 meters of two grams per ton silver. They never followed the hole deeper. So we think this system is still strong, bleeding up the tyrant fault as well. And uh, there's great potential to hit significant high grade silver, lead and zinc all the way out along these zones, start hitting into these areas as well. So um, again, it's still really early um, for us, you know, like like Mike was saying, we pretty much evolved our uh, interpretation on the fly um, to go after some of these deeper targets to the West. And, and I think as we work on our model um, throughout this fall, we're gonna do more mapping, more soils, more geophysics. We're really gonna try to tie in what that total metal zonation pattern looks like so we can better target our holes out in these areas under shallow cover. So um, you look to this main kind of, here's our main section has the highest density of drilling, really shows that continuity, right? I mean, right here, what's this, Mike, almost 1.5? Yeah, that's one yeah. point. Uh, 
right around 1.2 kilometers from here to here. The system outcrops its surface, dip shallowly under cover, you know, and we can, um, you know, this is just, that's our best drilled section. But if you think about what that section where hole 27 was, this would be the equivalent of hole 27 right here, where we hit the high grade in the chainman and then the extension of the zone. This would be the equivalent of those ratty drill holes that are on the edge of the juniper target. And here's 1.2 kilometers in between the two. So I think that's that's where we really are starting to see, you know, this is a big system. It's got lots of potential to grow. And yeah. the more and more, you know, the better we understand it, the more, uh, the more success we're having with the drill bit. So if we look to, uh, you know, surface, for example, whoops, didn't mean to do that. So look to surface, you know, we've defined these high grade centers right here. And you look every time you see one of these nice cross cutting fault zones, the Northwesters, that's where we get our high grade mineralization. So the last section we want to show you guys would be going up to the Tyrant Fault because you can see there's our Jasperoids. Our best developed Jasperoid is obviously within our, our discovery footprint, but I really want to show up you know, what we think we could find up at Juniper. So if we step to the north, go ahead, Mike. I'm just trying to switch it over. There we go. Okay, so yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier as we move west. So with the thrusting we've identified in the area and what has been mapped in the past, we see that we're missing most of our pilot formation and we have the Joanna just put on top of the Gilmet limestone below. Out to the west, we have preserved section. We believe we still have some chainmen out there based on some evidence from old drilling um, and some of the logs, but it remains untested out there. And they were seeing uh, these lower grade intercepts. Some of that was tied to what would be a fanglomerate, which is just a, an eroded portion of the, of the uh, deposit that's now sitting in a fault scarp or the drop down portion and it fills in the, the gap with some of the mineral mineralization from up top. But as we moved out west and as the historic drilling moved out west, they started getting more consistent um, intercepts as they got down through the Joanna and into the Gilmet, but didn't drill far enough into the Gilmet. So we started testing that. And as you can see out of hole, uh, some of the historic holes, they hit down in what would be the Gilmet. Some of our holes didn't hit there yet, um, but it's really moving out to where you have that preferred contact of pilot on top of the Gilmet because the pilot, pilot acts more as an aquitard or a restrictive unit, whereas the Joanna can absorb a lot of the mineralization and become the jasperoids we're seeing at surface. And so though that Joanna is the jasperoid we're seeing at surface and the edge of that thrust sheet. And that's how we're able to track the thrust so easily. Um, yep. And now we're trying to track those west northwest where they intersect. And we'll keep hammering that point, but that's the point of where these higher grade zones are. And we have a lot of those intersections and a lot of places where that lithologic contact between the pilot shale and the Gilmet limestone are preserved. And that's what we want. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think that, you know, although the, the results from Sonic, we would have loved to have seen wider intercepts, higher grades, no doubt about it, but it's, is important to point out. I mean, these are right at surface, right? Just like, you know, so they are low grade, but yeah, you know, if you have a heap leach scenario happening on site, um, maybe at the main discovery area, there's a good chance that some of this material is still going to end up on top of the leach pad. Um, and it's worth pointing out that like a lot of this material is actually the silver equivalent grades are largely being supported by gold grades. You're seeing that, that right. gold, the gold grades are picking up, the silver grades are reducing. Um, so as we head north towards Sonic, there might be potential for more of a gold rich system. Whereas you, as you head down towards the porphyry into our main discovery, you're into more of that silver lead zinc uh, type of system. So, um, you know, one other thing that's pretty interesting is um, if you just were going to tilt this up put the faults on here. Here is uh, da, 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 trying to get the right stuff on Mike. There we go. You look at the high grade center that we have right along the chinchilla fault cutting right through here, right? We have really, we have one drill hole, which just tagged into the edge. I think 35 hit roughly 12 meters of somewhere around 35, 30 grams per ton um, right. So equivalent right on the edge. But that fault cuts right up through here, and that's exactly where that preserved pilot sits. So if we just look down the strike of that, whoops, got to go down here. That's that same fault we want to be tracking, right? So we may be on the edge of, like Mike was saying up here, it's partially eroded. The main host rocks have been kind of thrusted up and eroded down, meaning it's not an optimal target. And where we want to be going now that we've drilled these confirmation holes and, and validated the old data is certainly the main target area 
to go after the higher grade gold targets is probably right along that structure. I got to zoom in more. Sorry, that's really there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that better yeah. Um, yeah so you know you can you start tracking these these high grade northwesters and you realize that every time you hit an intersection point with a northwest fault with the right host rocks preserved you can get a really nice blowout zone and, and i think that's we'll be able to target that really effectively heading into next year's program yep yep um so then just looking at the bigger picture you know we've now defined two plus kilometers of mineralized strike. The main core of the system sits here. This is about a kilometer long, kilometer 1.2 kilometers north-south yep. and 1.3 kilometers in the east-west. So we have a pretty significant size system already. There's potential for both open pit along outcropping mineralization here. And then as we get deeper out to the west, we're getting into much higher grades. There's potential for uh, this thing to maybe transition to uh, an underground type of scenario if we keep on hitting high grade mineralization. So then on top of that, you have the sonic target out here. There's still room to flesh that out with some well-placed drilling in the future and the juniper target. So just going back to that, there's that whole 27 right, where is it? That right? was it. Right there, right? Yeah. yeah, and, and the, dip, the between those two zones, the, the Juniper drilling, SE10 and, you know, 36, and then over here, that is mostly pilot limestone, or I'm sorry, pilot shale or Joanna limestone that's exposed at surface that has been thrusted up that we're seeing at the sonic target. But we're seeing that there with a completely preserved section, which is what's really exciting about the Juniper. Yeah. Um, it, it, so the same. It's been my favorite target since the beginning. Um, it's been under drilled um, at this time because we were focused on the main core where we were hitting these high grades. Um, but there's a lot of potential out there along a parallel structure to to that main chinchilla zone and the chinchilla target uh, that that rips right through the the juniper target, and you have a, an opportunity at both the juniper fault and the tyrant fault out there for some real joy. Yeah, no, I completely agree, bud. And like you look at this. And the same core of the system that we've kind of defined that's running along the northwest, north, northeast intersections right here, there's really good potential that we can fill that in and get another high grade section just like that. And that's, that's you know, we've bookended the zone. We have three meters and 90 grams silver here, um, four and a half meters of 150 grams silver here. That's 1.2 kilometers apart with uh, not one drill hole sitting in between them, right? So lots of upside potential. And um, yeah, I think... Um, you know, going back to kind of the bigger picture of what we see for Selena, you know, we've defined the scale, you know, we've defined that this thing is a large system. We know it can produce high grades. Um, it's shallow, it's oxide. And as this model has evolved here, I think what uh, we see is the, the main target here would be right here, right, Mike? The CRD, you know, defining that CRD potential. Yep. The yep. CRD potential and then the expansion of the, the silver gold or the, the silver gold sediment hosted portion, um, through the 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 uh, juniper area, yeah, um, and then we'll start uh, really bringing the broken egg target along uh, along with the rest of the targets this next year, um, yep. as it's its own area of that zonation pattern that could really have some joy with plus gram rock chips taking its surface over there and some pretty stellar uh, soils as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you know what we see is is a massive property that has multiple de multiple deposit types potentially preserved. And I think we're just right now, we're in the middle of sorting out what that zonation pattern is. And I mean, just to give it a little perspective, if you were to look at this same, you know, a schematic of what we think this looks like in 3D, um, a section looking here, this is kind of what we think is going on. So if this is an idealized porphyry model um, by Dick Silito. We've just kind of come in and, you know, if we were to assume that this right here is the equivalent of the Butte Valley porphyry, which sits on the edge of our property, then what have we defined so far? We've hit the sediment hosted gold and silver right here. We know that broken egg would be kind of sitting out in the edge right here. We got broken egg, the original discovery right here. And what we just started hitting into with holes 24, 25, 27 is the edges of that carbonate replacement silver lead zinc uh, system. So what we have now left for us is we've already tapped into the edge of that system. And we have over three kilometers of strike between the porphyry and that system, we could hit some more SCARN. We believe we're going to be able to hit some more silver lead zinc as well. And, and I think it could be an exciting year next year with the drill. I agree. Yep. yep. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, just an update, I guess, um, on what we're up to right now. We're also drilling at Carlin East. We're about 2,700 feet, not 2,600 feet down, sorry. Yes. Um, still in upper plate rocks. And, and we'll be providing updates to the market for that project as we, uh, we move along. So... Did I? Uh, did yeah, I we have uh, three. All three pre collars have been completed, um, and drilling the first core tail now. Yep. 
No, absolutely. Um, so that's all I have so far today. I guess we can see if anyone has any questions. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that, guys. That was a great, great presentation. So I'd just like to take a second and remind everyone in the audience that you can ask any questions you like using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen. But to start, I have a few questions uh, that I'd like to ask. Given the silver gold discovery last year and now the discovery of base metals, can you provide some context on what you think you have at Selena? This question was asked in advance of today's summit. Okay. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, we, you know, I think what we're realizing now is we have um, a really large zoned porphyry system. I think that's why the project was probably forgotten about for the last 20 years is because people always looked at it as just a gold open pit target, right? And if you look at it as just a gold target, it's kind of a piss poor <laughs> target to be fair, you know, kind of thing. So, um, but when you look at it from a silver lead zinc and plus or minus gold scenario, it suddenly starts getting pretty exciting. So we think we have a very large system and I think we're going to continue to make discoveries in 2022. Agreed. Yeah. That's great to hear. Uh, another question, what's the significance of discovery of a new mineralized horizon in the Chainman Shale? Do you want to take that one, Mike? Yeah, the significance of that is that um, one, as we get deeper, that allows for shallower um, intercepts uh, across the whole property, as a matter of fact, because um, one of our main concerns is, is that if we continue to get deeper um, we, and we don't have those high grades, we're going to start to lose the ability to, to have this thing be an underground mine. So being able to bring in uh, some of the what would be waste rock as actual ore really starts to become important to the metrics of the Salina system. Now, the other important thing is, is that this lithologic contact between the Chayman and the Joanna elsewhere on the South Carlin trend is a main host um, or can host significant ore bodies as well as the uh, pilot gill met contacts. So bringing that into the fold uh, really keeps the metrics of Selena uh, moving in the proper direction along with the metallurgy we're working on as well. But more the fact that if there's going to be another gold system or another system propagating, it, it's going to be at that contact. We know that that's a, a preferential contact in the area. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks for that, guys. Uh, a question that's yep. coming in. You state in today's press release that one of the priority target areas was to expand the known silver, gold, lead, zinc mineralization. Were you successful? Well, you know, it's funny, like Mike mentioned, we we kind of adjusted on the fly. So we started seeing, you know, we drilled hole 27 and we liked what we saw. So we went up and we drilled 29, which was almost 500 meters to the north. Um, so really wide space step outs, but we were primarily focused on trying to figure out what was going on at Sonic. And when we hit a good hole at, at 27, which was truly just a wildcat hole, um, you know, big step out, we added in hole 29. I think that overall between the intercepts in hole 24, 25, um, 28 and 27, uh, this was a very successful program overall. It showed that this system has continuity and that uh, it has room to grow. Yeah. Great. There's actually a little follow up to that same question. Um, the other target area was to test the shallow oxide silver gold mineral mineralization at the sonic target area. What's the significance of the results at sonic given the grades drilled? Well, they, uh, you know, like I said, during the, we mentioned here, Mike and I both would like to have seen higher grades, certainly, um, and wider intercepts. So I think that sonic would suggest to us that the system may be weakening a bit away from that porphyry, which would make sense, right? It's, it's an, another kilometer to the north of that porphyry system you're farther away, the gold and silver has to go farther to get up there. So, um, you know, I think that Sonic still has, like Mike and I mentioned, I'd say it's a pretty pretty interesting target out to the west undercover there at Mike along the Chinchilla Fault. It is, and the, the one thing we learned about the Sonic area um, is that portions of it are eroded off. It's gonna be the highest portion of our entire, um, our entire drill package. Um, and so it's gonna be the most eroded, the most um, exposed to surficial processes like that. So. Um, what, what, it's tell, what it told me as a geologist that moving down as you cross these west-northwest and you're dropping and preserving some of your section, that maybe it's not there to the north directly, but off to the west, it could still be preserved undercover. But that also keeps us from drilling holes in an area we might not think is the most productive. Um, and it starts to have us vector towards those areas that, that would be. Um, so I still like Sonic a lot. There's nothing wrong with the target it's, itself. It's just we drilled... Some, some confirmation holes to old data, but again, would like to see higher grades and we'll drill some of the deeper holes off to the west this next program and really try to see if that system is still very much alive out there, which we believe that it is. But, you know, uh, 
we're hoping to see better grades, but the silver just wasn't there, um, which shows us that we're, like Chad said, further out from the zonation pattern of that porphyry. And we hope to zone in on the better portions this next drill, uh, drill season. Yeah, it's really, you know, it's important to point out, you know, like this is one to one, like I mentioned, right? One to one silver, 10 to one silver, you know, here, 25 to one, 50 to one. We're all the way out to like, I think we've seen up to like a thousand to one silver to gold out in these areas, right, Mike? So you're yeah. just a very consistent, you know, as we drill out in these different areas, you're seeing a very consistent zonation to the system. So essentially if the porphyry is sitting right on the edge right here, you're just seeing everything bleeding out in all directions, right? So the farther you get away, you're up into the, you know, 10 to one to one to one silver up in that far corner. And the closer you get, the more silver you're gonna see as well, as well as base metals. And if you put, will you put the faults on real quick, Chad, at least the, the west, northwest, and northeasters? Oh, you're so needy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So you can really see without the thrust, if you, if you take that fabric kind of out of the larger picture, you can see that those faults actually tap into where the Butte Valley Porphyry is, the northeaster specifically, um, which would be open at the time of mineralization or where we're getting an opening of this, of this area. So the northeasters are open. The west northwest are the most damaged and oldest fabric of the area. So that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. And those are probably the tap roots into the main system, which yep. is what we're tracking. That great, that's awesome, guys. Thank you. Um, Nathan in the audience, uh, looking for some clarification on polymetallic zones versus gold silver zones. What sure. are the advantages of each in the Selena project? Well, I think, um, you know, what's really interesting there is anytime you have multiple metals, right, it gives you more flexibility, right? Maybe zinc prices are high, silver's high, gold's high. So it's nice, you know, I don't, I, you know, the more the better, in our opinion. Um, the polymetallic system is just part of the bigger zonation pattern. So we're going to see, you know, polymetallic or CRD as we refer to it, carbonate replacement uh, type deposits. We're going to see just more typical silver gold and all the way out towards broken egg in this area we're seeing just pure gold not not you know not pure gold i wish but um just gold just gold plus or minus silver so um i think it's a good sign for the project it shows just how big and how strong the system is that you can get multiple deposit types mineralizing all in the same area yep yep okay great uh francois in the audience asks if you guys have any idea of the extractive metallurgical characteristics of the polymetallic ore body uh, that's a tough one. Um, we're actually doing bottle rolls right now on, we have 10 bottle rolls going throughout the core of the deposit area here. Um, we're going to be testing lead and zinc um, bottle roll recoveries, but typically um, lead and zinc don't bottle roll or don't heap leach very well. So what we kind of see is as the next step in our metallurgy program is we'd like to define you know, that the silver and gold, how well they leach throughout this core area. And then we'll probably be doing a phase two program, which would look at potential milling and, and float um, type uh, testing to see how can we get out the polymetallic mineralization. So I think at any, any you know, oxide uh, project in Nevada or elsewhere for that matter, metallurgy is a lot of time is the biggest hurdle to overcome. And I think we need to try to address it early because we know we have a big system here and we need to know that we can get the metal out of it. And that feeds back into the previous question of why it's important to, to isolate these different deposit types across this property because the metallurgy changes, depth yeah. changes its metrics. And so it becomes a really big deal on how you treat these things. That's why we're doing the metallurgy early, like Chad said, so that we can understand these things um, and continue to drill them the proper way or chase the right mineralization um, for what we're trying to accomplish as we get deeper to the west or shallower to the east, uh, depending on where we are in that zonation pattern. Yeah. If we find out we can't get the lead and zinc out of there, we're going to be a heck of a lot less excited about going after a, a, a CRD type of deposit. But um, there is pretty standard milling techniques uh, for those types of deposits that are well established elsewhere in the world. And I think that we should be able to have some success figuring out what works best for this project. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Eric asks this. So your cash position is approximately 5.5 million. What yep. is the corporate burn rate? In terms of mining, permitting, are there social, animal, habitat, water issues? Yeah. So we're actually, um, we're in the process of, in the early stages of a plan of operations permit for Selena. So we're actually addressing all of um, those surveys. We've already done a bunch of biological surveys, et cetera. We have no serious uh, kind of, if you want to call it, um, hurdles to overcome from a permitting perspective. This is very simple geology, no endangered species, et cetera, um, at Salina. Um, our burn rate is right in around, I think if you look at our corporate rate, burn rate for the year is about a million dollars a year. 
that you know everything from pencils to geo salaries um, to that fancy Ridgeline shirt that Mike's wearing. So, um, so like we um, we're about a million bucks there. Obviously, when we're not dr when we're drilling, we can be considerably higher burn rate than that. But from a corporate perspective, our GNA is right in around a million, and that includes that includes land payments, by the way, as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, Rob wants to know if you could go over the varied projections you're working on. Uh, the projections. Um, could you, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, he's asked, could you go over the varied projections you're working on? Um, you know, we could see, you know, Rob, if you, if you'd like to get more specific, please, uh, I think I think David's actually in the back end saying oh, oh, sorry, projects. Projects. Uh, projects. Okay, there we go. Um, so we're also we're drilling the Carlin East project right now, which is if we look here's Carlin East it's right here, and it is a kind of a classic Carlin type gold target right in the heart of the North Carlin trend. You can see, you know, we have over about 150 million ounces of gold have been discovered along the post fault structure, which sits right. Where are you trying to find it? There we go. There we go. There's the Carlin trend kind of framework fault system. You know, most of the faults or the mineralization has been discovered all the way along this post fault. What's now been realized is this four corners fault is just as productive. It's just deeper. So the Leeville fault or the Leeville mine, which is 15 million ounces of underground is sitting right there. And then you look to what Barrick has now discovered along the Leeville corridor. They've made a new discovery just on trend of Leeville that's looking like a pretty significant system. So they've hit 12 meters of 18 grams, three meters of one gram, 32 meters of 16, over a kilometer and a half of strike. And Mike was just out there today. And wh where would you suggest they are, Mike? Are they sitting right about, Barrick is now drilling right about here. Would that be, whoops, let me get that down. Would that be appropriate right there? Yeah, right about there. Yeah, that's where that radio tower is about. Yeah, so they're drilling. They're now less than two kilometers. They're about a kilometer and a half from the edge of our property. They're continuing to march up this fault zone, which is the main mineralizing structure to the whole uh, Leeville structural corridor. And we're actually drilling at the crash zone right here. So we're drilling right along the projection of that fault, along the intersection of a big intrusion on our project. And I'll show you what that looks like in section. So that is right there. And this is what we're going after. So this is just kind of the classic. We've built this, our geologic model off of barracks, uh, cross sections, et cetera, that they've put out there. So this is the same four corners fault right there. And I got to update this section because what we actually did is we drilled a vertical hole and it's right about there. We think it's sitting right above the lower plate contact at this point. We probably will hit it sometime in the next three to 500 feet. And um, we'd be going after a classic just Carlin type deposit on the in the uh, bootstrap formation, uh, which is the host of the North Leeville discovery. So um, really excited about how that project could turn out. That could be a total game changer for the company. I think what's really exciting about our company is, you know, we have this, this shallow, very, relatively cheap project at Selena that we can advance very quickly. And then on top of that, we're really kind of swinging for the fences with, uh, with Carlin East and our Swift project as well, which is a similar deeper target. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, David asks, are polymetallic ore bodies common in Nevada or just mainly gold or silver deposits? You know what? They are fairly common, but they're, they've, they're kind of overshadowed by the fact that Nevada is such a, a huge, hugely endowed gold uh, state, right? So there's all kinds of, um, you know, examples of deposits that are polymetallic systems that are directly adjacent to Carlin type systems, you know, whether it's the Mike deposit on the North yeah. Carlin trend, you go down to Eureka, um, which is on the southern tip of the Battle Mountain Eureka trend. And there's, I mean, it's mostly polymetallic uh, mineralization down there. So it's, I think it's far more common than people realize. And I think it's, you know, I hope, I hope at least with Selena that we'll start seeing some more excitement. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Um, how much more drilling do you think you need to do at Selena to feel really comfortable with the geologic model? Drill forever. No, um, <laughs> don't ask the geologist that. They'll tell you there's always one more hole. Um, I, I think that um, we're getting pretty darn confident with the model now. I think we'd probably want to see about 10 holes, wouldn't you think, Mike, out to the west to try to figure, figure yeah, out? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be accurate, right? Um, yeah. To really um, vector in and away from some of the intercepts we've already had out there um, and then test a couple of new areas we haven't yeah. gotten to yet. But it would take at least 10, maybe 15. Like Chad said, I'll keep adding them on there if you let me. But <laughs> Between 10 and 15 really would help us define what we're looking for, give us some of those structural intersections and another place to leap forward um, 
from any kind of um, success from those holes. We need, and we need to know scale, right? So, I mean, yeah. if you're looking, you know, if, if we are able to go out and we define a good polymetallic zone here, that's all well and good, but to do a resource, you know, we need to drill this thing on, you know, at the very bare minimum hundred foot center. So we're talking, you know, tons of drill holes all in here. They're shallow, but they take time and we're going to need our plan of operations permit to really let us get into that stuff. So I think the first step is let's figure out how big this system could truly be and then try to define what maybe a resource might start looking like here. And, and I think that would be something we could start looking into later in 2022. Agreed. And we have under our existing NOI the ability to test those those uh, larger step outs to show the scale before the plan of operations would go into effect. So yeah. it's a really good timeline for us to continue exploring and then be ready for the bigger push of the infill drilling um, and further definition of targets out to the west uh, after that, say, 10 to 15 hole program would have yeah. been executed. Drill a bunch of holes out to the west, get her sorted out, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, what else do you want to demonstrate to the markets before you sell Selena? Um, you know, I think that um, we really need to understand this polymetallic um, story, right? Because I, I and not to refer you know, we're probably referring to a, an amazing deposit, which is the Taylor discovery and, and which was sold to South 32 in 2018. Um, I'm not saying we have Taylor here, but what's really interesting is that Taylor started as Wildcat Silver. So before Arizona mining, it was Wildcat Silver. They were looking for a shallow oxide silver system which they called hermosa it wasn't until don taylor came in drilled underneath the silver system and started hitting high grade silver lead zinc that that project really took off i think we're just starting to tag into you know we thought we had a silver system we've just tagged into the silver lead zinc um and i think there's huge potential here for for a, a large discovery but until we get this sorted out out in the valley we wouldn't be interested in selling this project in any way yeah, we definitely have to give it the true legs that it has or the true value if it's there yeah. before it ever got let go. Um, and that's just to honor our shareholders. At this point, um, Selena is our cheapest to drill. Um, our, yep. What is our per foot cost of discovery so far? Uh, our, oh, geez. Well, um, our cost, our average cost per foot of drilling has been rated in around 15 to 17 bucks a foot. I think we did a rough mineral inventory just you know, internally, and it was looking like it was roughly in the 25 cents per silver ounce that we were looking at per ounce. So um, we obviously that's very loose and we need yeah. to tighten that just, up. It, it, it just means that we can get in there cheaply and continue yeah. to explore this property and give it that expansion that it so desperately needs because there's a lot of potential out there and I'm excited to get a drill back out there and, and start working on it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks guys. Well, just to uh, remain cognizant of timing, um, you know, maybe we move on to uh, a, a portion where you could maybe please summarize again what your plans are going forward at Selena here. Sure. Okay. Well, um, you know, I think what we're going to be doing the rest of the year, we're obviously pretty focused on Carlinese. We want to make sure we, we knock that out of the park. In the late fall, we're probably going to go out. We'll start mapping. We'll do additional, potentially additional soils. You can see here, um, we've only got soils data for a portion of the project, right? Since we've made this discovery, we've expanded the land package by this much here and by this much here. So we need to grow that. We need to do soils. We need to do more geophysics and IP survey yeah. across here would be incredibly effective at potentially tracking these polymetallics. So I think this fall will be data collection, building out the model. And then next spring, we'll be heading into that 10, you know, 10 to 15 old drill program that Mike and I were previously discussing. Yep. Okay, great. Um, you know, we do have a, a couple minutes left still, uh, and Eric in the audience has asked this. Um, the Selena budget for 2021 and 2022 would be of what order? Uh, could you remind us of the potential royalty situation? Yeah, so we've spent 1.5 million, give or take, uh, at Selena in 2020 and 2021. Um, actually, actually, sorry, that was 2019 through 2021. So the total life of the project, we've put 1.5 million in the ground. I think we've gotten a lot back in return. And um, sorry, what was the second half of the question? Uh, you, the, the, the royalties on it. Ah, right. So this whole project is 3.25% that can be bought down to 2.25% for $3 million. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on today. And I, I'd like to thank also everyone in the audience. Um, you know, Chad, if you have any closing remarks, please feel free to at this time. 
Uh, well, you know, this is a really quickly evolving story for us. We've really hit it hard. Um, that being said, we can't cover everything all in one day, although I think we did an all right job today. So I really encourage folks, if you want to talk to Mike or I, I'm at cpeters at ridgelineminerals.com. Mike's at mharp at ridgelineminerals.com. You know, send us an email. We'd be happy to walk you through this thing in more detail or walk through our other projects. So I'd say, um, you know, Selena is just part of the story. Um, and Carlin East, I think, is going to be a pretty exciting uh, um, fall for us. So. I guess we'll stay tuned on that. Okay. Well, Great. thanks guys again. Uh, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.